to you. I'm Becky Kaiser. Welcome to the Kansas Legislature Show right here on Smoky Hills PBS in Bunker Hill. And we have a couple of guests who are from Western Kansas to talk to us tonight. And we're hoping that you'll be able to participate in the show by giving us a call. I want to thank you for being here. I'm a reporter for Hayes Post, Eagle Radio News in Hayes, and also I am a fellow with the Docking Institute at Fort Hayes State University. I want to introduce our guests to you, familiar faces, of course, from Western Kansas. To my far left is uh, Bill Clifford, who is from Garden City, of course, District 122. And then closest to me on, le on my left is Representative Adam Smith, who is from Weskin in far western Kansas, District 120. Welcome to you both. It's good to see you again. Bill, I thought we'd start with you and remind people what committees you're working on this year and, and maybe some topics that you're really taking a close look at. Sure. Well, I might not be that familiar a face since I shaved my mustache since last year. <laughs> it is actually you. Yeah, but I'm uh, now serving my third year in the legislature, started in 2021, having replaced the late Russ Jennings. Uh, I serve on the Financial Institutions and Pensions Committee. Uh, since I'm a physician, I serve on the Health uh, Committee in the House and also on the Social Services Budget Committee. All right. And Representative Smith, tell us a little bit about your committee work, please. Thank you, Becky. And first of all, I'd like to thank you and Smoky Hills Public Television for hosting this show. Uh, I was a big fan of it when I was a county commissioner and, and would tune in to watch, uh, get the, the latest updates on the legislature. So thank you for all you do and, and getting the message out to the Western Kansas folks. Uh, as you said, my name's Adam Smith. I serve the 120th district up in Northwest Kansas uh, in the very far corner. Uh, I serve currently as chairman of the tax committee and I also serve on the Federal and State Affairs Committee, which is a, a very interesting committee because they d deal with all of your uh, things that don't fit in other committees. They're kind of <laughs> the leftover. Uh, anything to do with Second Amendment, gun rights, uh, abortion, marijuana legalization, uh, gambling, any of those uh, federal, uh, federal and state uh, interactions there. Uh, it's a very interesting committee. Uh, unfortunately, this year we've been kind of quiet. We haven't done a whole lot in that committee. Uh, there haven't been any really big issues that, uh, that have come before the committee. So that one's been pretty tame, uh, getting started in the first month of January. I also serve on the Corrections and Juvenile Justice uh, Committee. That's the committee that the former uh, Representative uh, Jennings had chaired and was actually, uh, the committee work was named after him uh, when he passed. So it's an honor to serve on that committee. Uh, several of the things that we've been tackling in that committee so far, uh, one of the interesting ones is uh, we occasionally have service dogs, um, law enforcement service dogs, canines in the Capitol, uh, running around for security. I've never had one uh, testify before. Last week we had, uh, I can't remember what his name is, I, I'm I apologize, I just forgot that. But we had a service dog that, that came in to testify with his, with his handler um, to address a, a, a bill that I didn't realize was necessary, but the speaker and the chairman, uh, Stephen Owens, uh, and the speaker, Dan Hawkins, had introduced a bill to increase the penalties for injuring or killing a police dog. Uh, Current law, there, there isn't much penalty for injuring or intentionally injuring or, or even killing a police dog. Uh, we'd heard testimony from several officers, uh, canine officers, that had been involved in situations. These are highly trained dogs. They're highly skilled. Uh, the number of hours that goes into uh, putting in the, the training necessary for these dogs is incredible. And there's really no penalty for intentionally hurting or killing these dogs. So uh, we heard that. Um, the, the canine was there. He was very well behaved, better than, the, better than most of the, the committee members probably, but uh, he did a great job, uh, came in there. Um, that, was, that was a great hearing. Uh, we look forward to moving that bill along. Um, it was kind of personal to me because just the week before that, I think was when we had the crash out on, on I-70 here. Uh, that was not uh, necessarily an intentional uh, as far as criminal activity, but you know, uh, Igor got, he was in the trooper's car when that car was struck, and uh, it's my knowledge he's making a, a full recovery at this point. That's but what I uh, 
you know, it was something that kind of hit home to me because I, I did ask the question because there are some times that, that canines are accidentally injured and I wanted to make sure that this was only, you know, knowingly and intentionally harming a police dog uh, that would qual qualify for, for this further severe penalty. So at this, there's really nothing, as you said, there is nothing then at, to, at this point. It's, it's strictly up to the, to the judge, uh, this, this new bill, and I, don't, I can't remember all the specifics, but it sets some minimums, and the judge can actually go back and recover uh, if there are hospital costs for injuring a dog, uh, any, of the, any of the medical bills associated with that. If a dog is killed, um, you can go back and, and try to recover uh, some of the training costs and the purchase of the initial dog and then the training costs that were involved with getting that that animal up to speed and becoming the, the highly skilled tool that it is uh, for our law enforcement officers. We hear of lots of cases where they've been very successful in, in working a case. Uh, a lot of drug interdiction happens and you, that's pretty regular anymore that you hear about that. Yeah, and then it's, it's amazing the skills that the, the, that the dogs have that, that humans do not. The, the sense of smell, the, the ability to go in and neutralize a situation where no human officer would have the ability to get in there with this, the speed and accuracy uh, that these dogs have. Um, I, I apologize, I called them a tool. They're really not a tool because even in the hearing, uh, the handlers that get up and spoke, uh, they're their partner. Mm. I mean, it was, it was kind of an emotional hearing because we heard from uh, some of the officers that had lost their, their partner and uh, it's, it's pretty traumatizing for, for everybody in the department. I thought we'd start off this evening by a couple things that have been in the news this week coming out of the Capitol in Topeka. And uh, one that people probably are familiar with some of the terminology and the names, but we're not, you know, may not understand and I don't, so I'm hoping that you can clarify this for me, either one of you. The Supreme Court of Kansas issued an order on Tuesday releasing jurisdiction of the Gannon versus the state school finance case. And that has, you know, talking about school finance, and that's the biggest part of the budget, of course, we know that uh, that has to be taken care of every year. So what does that mean exactly, releasing jurisdiction of this? Well, four years ago when the Supreme Court had ruled that the school finance, uh, the bill that had passed the legislature was constitutional, they did what's called retaining jurisdiction. And that basically says since we, we kind of phased out the bill that we passed had kind of a phase-in structure of increasing a little bit of funding each year. Uh, four years ago we didn't have the budget surplus that we have today, so we had to gradually increase that funding level. So the court essentially said, until you've met your obligations, we're going to retain jurisdiction. Now what that means is if we had ever failed to maintain the funding that we had promised, the, the Supreme Court could immediately come in and rule our funding unconstitutional and make us come back to fulfill our obligations. Uh, with the appropriations that are in place right now, we have fulfilled that obligation, therefore the Supreme Court uh, released jurisdiction. At this point, if we do anything that uh, is perceived to provide less funding to the schools, we have to start all over with a brand new lawsuit. Uh, we've had Gannon, we've had Montoy, uh, several different throughout the years uh, when, when school funding maybe perhaps was uh, in a decline. Uh, it, at this point, once, once that happens, it would take a brand new lawsuit to, to work through the system. Representative Clifford, we were talking just a moment ago before we went on the air, I was asking about the uh, funding for special education because that has been a hot topic and there's the, the state somewhat has its hands tied in this. Uh, we do. Uh, obviously the federal government promised to any up there 40% uh, of the funding and uh, my understanding is it's still in the teens. They really haven't fulfilled their part of it. So <clears throat> the state's being asked to fill in the gap. I know you discussed that last week on, on the program. Um, you know, interestingly, and they're always behind the scenes things, uh, I'm sure we'll get to the uh, tax cut package here tonight since we have the tax chair from the House, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, behind the scenes in the Senate, there's a little negotiating on special education in order to get some votes to put uh, an override vote together in the Senate. We'll see. And I, I guess I should point out too that this, this isn't just Kansas, this is all states are in somewhat in the same boat then with the federal. Yes. But the local uh, districts are being hurt. They're taking money from their general funds to fulfill their <coughs> local obligation to uh, 
provide special education. So uh, I really think the legislature needs to step up. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, let's talk taxes. That's always a very popular topic. And uh, Representative Smith, of course, is, as uh, chair of this, you've been uh, very involved in there. We've heard the, the governor presented her budget and uh, the uh, Republicans have talked about a flat tax plan, which I guess maybe let's just start with that. What does that mean exactly? And why do you feel like that would be the best way to go? Okay, the, and it's called lots of different things. Uh, I don't care what it's called. I care about the way the policy works. Um, essentially what it is, it's you have one single tax rate. Functions very similar to the way our sales tax rate works. Uh, state rate is 6.5%. You pay that whether you buy something that's $10 or $100 or $10,000, you pay 6.5% on that purchase. Uh, the way the, the income tax rate piece would work is currently we have three different levels mm -hmm. of income tax. Uh, 3.1 percent, uh, if you're a single filer, that's between your first uh, zero to fifteen thousand dollars of income, taxable income that you have, you pay 3.1 percent on. From 15, again, for as a single filer, from 15 to 30,000, you pay 5.25 percent, and then on anything above 30,000, you pay 5.7%. So you have three tiers. If you look at it on a graph, you're paying a little bit on the lowest amount, then you pay a little bit more on the middle amount, and then anything above that $30,000 uh, is paid at the higher rate. Now, for, for uh, if you're filing uh, jointly, if you're married filing jointly, those, those numbers are double, uh, 30,000 and 60,000 for those different levels. But effectively, it, it's, it's designed to be a progressive tax code where the more you make, the more you owe in taxes. Uh, that's the only, uh, only tax that functions that way. Sales tax is all a single rate. Uh, property tax is all a single rate. Uh, you pay the same mill levy, no matter how expensive your, or what the value of your home is. Uh, it's, it's a single tax rate that's applied equally to all. And the premise behind a single rate is, is really about fairness. Uh, if I'm buying a car that's $10,000, I'm going to pay a fourth of the tax that I would pay that if I bought a car that was $40,000. Um, there's no real justification on progressive tax rates that say, okay, well, if you buy that car that's $40,000, you should pay six times the sales tax versus the $10,000. I mean, it, it's really uh, disproportionate. Uh, the single rate is a lot easier for our economists to predict mm -hmm. revenues and incomes to the state uh, based on different economic situations. It's a much simpler tax uh, to implement and predict. Um, there's lots of different things in that package. Uh, we, we also have some sales tax and property tax pieces too. We can get into that, but the, the thing that seems to be the, the line in the sand for the governor is the single rate. Um, she's she said that she's concerned that that's going to take us back to the Brownback tax plan. Um, she throws that around a lot, but this is not uh, taking this, that state rate to zero. Uh, if you remember what the, the tax plan was in 2012, it was the immediate elimination of certain corporate income taxes, and then it was a, depending on what the phrase was, whether it was the march to zero or the glide path to zero, it was essentially the elimination of income tax. Yes. A single rate tax doesn't do that. It's, it's a fixed amount. Um, we won't see any further reductions in the future. We're not trying to go down to zero, um, but it does make it a lot easier. In fact, um, I think Senator Bellinger alluded to this last week on the show. Uh, Colorado, I think, currently is at 4.4% and they are uh, dropping their income tax rate down to 4%. Um, it makes that change really easy uh, to, to understand that the impact of the state. And I think Nebraska, there's a number of states that are already doing this. Nebraska, another neighbor, <coughs> Kansas is doing that yeah, as well. Yeah, I think there's a total of 13 states, and it's not a partisan issue. This is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. Uh, probably two of the bluest states in the, in the Midwest region, Colorado and Illinois, both have single rate flat tax uh, income tax structure. So it's, it's not something that's going to break the bank. Um, I've, I've visited with uh, Representative Waymaster. Uh, obviously, everybody's very familiar with him, the chair of uh, the Budget and Appropriations Committee in the House, to understand what number 
uh, how much tax cut can we afford and still be sustainable with the budget? Uh, who, he, who comes up with those numbers? How well, do you it's essentially that? a prediction. Um, I'm sure Troy look, sits down with his people, the, the experts. I've got some experts on my side. Trust me, I'm not smart enough to know everything. So I have uh, experts that are, are kind of counseling me on what tax strategy is, is fair, what things uh, are, are more equal and uniform as far as how you treat folks with tax policy. Uh, so I'm sure Troy is sitting down with, with his folks and the consensus revenue group really helps out a lot with this at the state level as they're trying to predict what the future uh, revenue looks like for the state, what future expenditures are for the state budget, and we kind of balance that out. What do you say to people, that, and, I, and I know there's been some testimony on this, and, and I think the governor has said it herself, that the, and we're talking five and a quarter still? Yes, the current plan is at 5.25. 5.25. Um, what do you say to people that, it, that it's not fair for the lowest income people, that five and a quarter percent of of $1,000 is a, is a bigger percentage than some, some say they are making that per year versus somebody making $10,000 a year and paying five and a quarter. How does that, how is that equitable? Right, and you can either talk percentages or you can talk dollars. Uh, the, the confusion starts when you start mixing the two together. Um, you know, a $1,000 tax cut for someone on a lower income might be a 100% tax cut. Uh, for somebody on an upper income, if you're making $100,000, $200,000, that's, that's a fraction of, of a cut for them. Uh, so you can talk dollars or you can talk percentages. Ultimately, um, I'm trying to remember what the numbers are, but the, the folks, I think we have about 20% of taxpayers, of the, the actual tax returns that come into the state, pay approximately 75% of the taxes. So any, any change that you make in, in the rate is going to obviously impact them more because they're paying a, a larger share of the taxes already. But something interesting that we've built into the tax policy that's been presented to the governor, it was also in the policy last year that was vetoed toward the end of the session, was we've always taken out, you start with your, I'm not, I'm not trying to get nerdy here, but when you do your taxes, you start with your federal adjust, adjusted gross income and then you subtract out the standard deduction or your itemized deductions if you're itemizing, mm -hmm. and then also your personal exemptions. You get that for each member of your household, and that gives you your Kansas adjusted gross income. We've always started taxing it from that point. We do have a, a little threshold in there at, at $2,500 for a single filer and $5,000 for a joint filer. You don't owe actually owe any tax until you hit those levels, but as soon as you earn $1 over that threshold, you immediately owe tax on everything back to that original zero number. So we've taken out, out that cliff, plus we've extended, uh, and by cliff I mean we've taken that out, so if you earn one dollar more, you just owe on that, that extra dollar that you went over that threshold. We've increased that threshold from 2,500 $2, to $6,150 and $12,300. So we've increased that almost two and a half times uh, to try to give a, a broader tax relief to a lot of those lower income folks specifically. And Adam, uh, you know, I look at it as a two-tiered tax because yep. several hundred thousand people, at least a hundred thousand new people, will become zero ratepayers, zero tax. And then the folks generally above 30,000 will continue to pay the state income tax. So uh, you could say flat tax, you use a lot of different names, but you know, I really like to think of it as, as two-tiered. And I think it's more predictable for businesses coming into the state. They know what the taxes are going to be, and that allows us to grow our, our Kansas economy. So do you think it would be attractive to, to new business coming in? Absolutely. Now, you know, we have to get more competitive with <clears throat> pardon me, the surrounding states, but I certainly think uh, seeing a one number is easy to, to deal with. That, Another question that comes up, you talked about the uh, more, a bigger number of people would go to zero, owing zero. What does that do to Kansas income then? Because, you know, nobody wants to pay taxes, but if we don't have them, the state's not going to be able to operate very well. Right, and that comes, I wish I would have brought my chart. I could have broken it down a little bit better, but um, that, that first group that pays, uh, there's a group from zero to $25,000 of Kansas aggressive adjusted gross income, they pay 
a, a fraction. It's like, I think, two or three percent of the actual overall tax in Kansas. So providing tax relief at that lower end actually doesn't cost the state that much in total taxes. Um, that's also a reason that the standard deduction and the personal exemption were put in place originally was to try to allow those, those families, uh, lower income families, uh, a little extra help or relief on their taxes. We don't, we don't tax the first dollar you earn. We, we provide that standard deduction, which is, I think originally it was intended to say, okay, how much would it cost you to, to live per year? And, and we aren't gonna tax any income up to that point. Uh, the problem is that standard deduction has been fixed in statute as a dollar amount. Uh, we did make a slight increase in it a few years ago, but it's basically been stagnant for about 30 years. And I guarantee you $3,500 today doesn't buy what it used to 30, 30 years ago. So, uh, and that was another part of our policy of, is we've uh, created a, a dynamic tax code that allows the standard deduction to grow with inflation also the personal exemption to allow those numbers to grow with inflation each year. So as, as inflation hits and your, your dollar is worth less, that, that standard deduction provides more tax relief uh, on that disposable income. Talking about dollars, Representative Clifford, um, and inflation, we know that, that it's a problem. I don't know that the states can do that much about it, um, but there's concern that or I, I guess I, I should ask, is there a concern? We know that the Kansas budget is much better off than it has been for some time. Is inflation a factor? Do we need to be worried about it? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, in some ways, uh, inflation's the government's friend because we continue to get increasing tax revenue. Uh, it's particularly egregious for taxpayers who own homes. And when I go back to my district, that's all I hear is property tax. People want property tax relief. Um, and I can just assure you that there's a little worry about the out years. You know, we know we have a very large surplus now, mm -hmm. approaching $3 billion. We put away the rainy fund money over 1.6 billion. So we know we have a cushion, but some members might vote against the tax uh, cuts, thinking that 27, 28, those years, we'll start to see a dip, dip in revenue. <clears throat> We're not going to. We have a very robust tax base, and we have inflation still that's increasing government revenues. Uh, I think the numbers that Adams put together to, and Troy Waymaster to cut about five to six hundred million, very affordable. We can we can do it. One of the problems, though, is the other side of government. It's the spending side, and the governor uh, the governor presented us a budget with 1.3 billion of additional spending. We're not going to do that. Our caucus, our Republican caucus, and we control this process, is going to cut spending so we keep the revenues and the spending aligned. And that's no doubt a tough part, cutting spending, because everybody, I, we've heard you talk before, even last year, where everybody has an ask on this, ex, the, all this extra money floating around and everybody wants a part of it, but the, you can't do that very easily. No, uh, I mean, you heard last week, uh, you know, to fund a, a completely new uh, pay, uh, uh, jail for $375 million. I mean, that's, that's a big number to put up front and write a check. Uh, we, we need to bond projects like that. So uh, we, we'll, we'll negotiate, you know, we'll get to a number that works, but uh, we'll smooth it so that we don't have this sudden increase of $1.3 billion in spending. Thought we might talk a little bit, uh, Representative Clifford, uh, with your interest, of course, uh, in medicine, you were telling me a little bit ago before we started the show, uh, some concerns about ambulance uh, services, especially in rural Kansas. And apparently, I, I, I'm, it makes me think about firefighters too, that people may not realize that I think it's, I think the number's 80% of our Kansas, Kansas firefighters are volunteers which is just amazing. And our ambulance uh, drivers and ambulance systems, obviously they have to be professionals at a certain level, but we don't have that many of them. No, and uh, you know, it's a struggle. We, we have a state regulation that requires one uh, certified uh, emergency responder on an ambulance. Uh, the other person can be the vehicle driver with some modest training, but the State Board of uh, EMS has put a two 
emergency responder requirement uh, on everyone, and that works fine in cities, but districts like uh, uh, Representative Smith and I represent just don't have those personnel. Uh, it's particularly difficult when you have uh, uh, facility to facility transfers where you have to send two of your EMTs out of town to Wichita or to, to Denver in, in our case. Uh, we, we don't have those uh, bodies. So there have been another initiatives by the legislature over the years that, that have been frankly thwarted. Uh, there are new bills in play now. Uh, last year Senate Bill 312 addressed this issue. It's still sitting in Senate local government uh, and hasn't moved. Uh, but next week uh, there'll be a hearing on Senate Bill 384 uh, and that's been brought by the, uh, by the uh, League of Municipalities uh, in order to try to mitigate that requirement. Uh, I still think the bar is too high for our rural communities. One night, and you know, uh, Adam and I are driving back at night uh, from the legislature a lot. I'm on Highway 156 out of Larned, Kansas, and I see red lights in the mirror, and I think, uh-oh, I got caught speeding. Well, you can't get off that road unless a farm road appears because there are no shoulders. So I slowed down and an ambulance passed me. And I was able to follow that ambulance that night and it went 20 miles to the city of Roselle, about 500 people. So I just prayed that that person didn't have a heart attack. Roselle has one EMT that could have responded with their ambulance and a driver and at least met that Larned ambulance halfway or got that person to care a lot faster. So uh, we're really hurting our rural communities by this uh, requirement and, and I, won't, I won't let it die. I'm gonna work this. It makes me think of the nursing shortage, not only in Kansas, but across the United States. And there have been a lot of things done in Kansas to help more people become qualified nursing. Is that something that the state could get involved with, with, with uh, EMTs, ambulance drivers and services? There are uh, scholarships available. Again, you're asking people to leave their work to get training, so it's very difficult. So if we can uh, have a, a limited training of a, of a driver that has CPR, first aid treatment, uh, we can have an individual drive that vehicle with a qualified EMT in the back. You know, you mentioned nursing. We were talking about nursing earlier. The state has stepped in with a lot of funds for nursing. Uh, my background, uh, in addition to being a a uh, county commissioner like uh, Representative Adams. Uh, I was a community college trustee for 14 years. And I, I, I tell people, I don't think we'd have a nurse in Western Kansas if not for the community colleges. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have exceptional programs. Uh, we've laddered those programs with, where you get your, your basics, your LPN, uh, RN, and then there are articulation agreements with schools like Fort Hayes where you can get advanced nursing degrees uh, all the way up to a doctorate in nursing. So I think we've done a great job uh, through the higher ed system uh, facilitating uh, training for people who, who can't be at KU or can't uh, travel to Wichita for their training. Thought we might ask you the question, uh, there was a little bit of information about this uh, and there's been talk about it off and on over the years, but it looks like maybe this is going to happen that you guys are gonna get a pay raise. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we should say congratulations. Uh, <laughs> as you know, uh, the legislature passed a bill to create a pay commission, which met uh, during the last year and they came up with a proposal to uh, increase legislative salaries. Um, you know, for me, I, I want a new generation to show up in the legislature. I mean, we in our caucus, if you took a show of hands who's retired, it would be the majority of hands. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the two of us, uh, Adam's a rancher and he has a little flexibility, and I'm later in my career as an eye surgeon, so I have uh, the flexibility and the means to, to go and serve uh, at, at a, for a modest income. Uh, I want to see the next generation come. I want to see a diverse legislature and I think the only way we can do that is to attract people with with a salary that's at least affordable you know, for a part-time uh, legislator. How difficult it is, is it for you as an ag guy to get away and get to Topeka regularly Adam? Well the nice thing about being an ag uh, producer is usually you're in, in session 
during the winter time. There's not a lot of farming activity. Unfortunately, I also have cattle. So that makes life kind of interesting, especially early in January this year when it was uh, 20 below zero at certain places out in, in western Kansas. But it does make it difficult. And I think a lot of people, um, maybe not a lot of people, but some people don't realize what the salary is. Uh, my w, W2 this year from the state was less than $15,000. Now we do have additional compensation, there's a per diem because legislators pay for our own lodging. Uh, we have to find apartments or hotel rooms to stay in, uh, mileage back and forth, we pay for that. There is some reimbursement, so sometimes uh, the, the total package deal is, is sometimes approaching that twenty-five dollars to $30,000, but the actual salary that you earn isn't that much. Um, I was very in favor of the commission because anytime you get a bunch of politicians together arguing about what they think they should be paid. I don't think that's very legitimate. So a third party, uh, nonpartisan commission to sit down and, and go through that. I watched some of the meetings. I thought they did a very uh, pragmatic job of going through and analyzing not necessarily what we're being paid now, but looking at other states, looking at, at other industry standards. You know, what are these people having to give up to run for office? Um, we all know what the pay is when we run, and I guess most of us do, maybe some of them don't, but uh, it's not near what some people think it is. And uh, the part that I didn't really necessarily agree with was the fact that it would happen automatically. Uh, I like the fact of a, fact of a third party uh, commission being able to kind of make suggestions to the, to the legislature, but I feel like we should have voted on it. It seems a little shady, like we're trying to hide something by not voting on it. Uh, I have no problem voting on a, a pay increase or decrease or whatever the suggestion is, as long as it doesn't happen until after the election. If this would have happened midterm, you are, you are literally voting yourself a pay increase. Uh, every election, every two years, as representatives, we're up on the ballot. Uh, this year, everybody is. Senate is all on the ballot. Representatives, House of Representatives are all on the ballot. Um, that gives everybody an opportunity to say, hey, here's, here's the new pay. If you feel, I'm not the smartest guy in my district, I guarantee you, there is somebody out there that can do a better job at this than I'm probably doing. But maybe they're, they're tied to uh, their job or something that they're involved with in their community and can't get away. Um, maybe this will entice uh, better legislature. It's, it's the old adage, uh, you get what you pay for. So. <laughs> How does Kansas stack up against other states? Are our legislators legislators paid and paid well? We're we're about in the middle to below middle. I mean, there are some states where it's zero, frankly. Uh, now they're extremely part time. Others where it's a very uh, well compensated full time job. So, uh, yeah, with the salary that was uh, arrived at by the pay commission was basically the median salary of a state worker in Kansas. That's what the, the choice was. So, and uh, I guess we can debate whether it went into effect or not, but we, uh, we had about 30 days to, to vote it down. Yeah, uh, the deadlines passed, so it's, it's going to be coming so in place, happen. yes. Yeah, but for 2025, so all of us have to pass through the ballot and uh, you know, stand up and tell the voters that, that we let that uh, go into uh, effect uh, in 2025 when the new uh, legislature is seated. It's interesting you mentioned so, such a large number of legislators are retired, but when you think about it, not such a big, huge commitment to a job then. Right, they, they have the time and the wherewithal. I mean, this we're a part-time legislator. We, we have 90 days, but once we hit April 30th and, when, and we're out of session, we could spend two or three days every week Till December on legislative matters. Yeah, no, uh, stop. No. Well, yes, so, I mean, it's not like you're not already busy doing other things, and not and in Topeka sometimes. But you have constituents that you're meeting with, and I know you yeah. go to lots of meetings. And we don't have a, necessarily a staff when we're out of session. We have office assistants. The, the chairs have a little more help, but off session we don't have folks to do a constituent work. So we are doing that. In fact, I find that to be one of the more satisfying parts of the job. Uh, I've intervened for three physicians to get them their licenses. Uh, I helped the city of Jetmore uh, get a road right of way so they get a, a truck stop uh, finished up. I mean, things like that uh, you know, mean a lot to, to individuals and communities. And uh, for the most part, we get our phone calls answered in Topeka. When we call the agencies, they return our calls, and that's a good thing. 
And I would echo that's one of my favorite parts of my job that I didn't really anticipate when I first ran for this. You know, what happens in the, in the Capitol, that's, that's all over the news, and, and now it's all over uh, the live stream, too. You can watch, watch the proceedings in committees and on the floor. But the constituent services out of session, uh, that's one of the most rewarding things when you can help somebody, you know, during COVID with the unemployment claims, uh, that was critical. Uh, helping helping nur nursing homes with uh, with licensing, uh, had some uh, run-ins with the fire marshal's office, and uh, sometimes all it takes is a phone call, and that, that's sad to say, but that, that does feel very rewarding when you can help your local communities uh, just with a few phone calls. Thought we might talk about the foster child care system. It's uh, it's an ongoing problem, I guess, to say. Um, there's been a little bit of movement. Uh, the the governor has come up with some ideas there, and I think that was this week also uh, an idea that was put forward for foster kill, foster children in Kansas who apparently are still sleeping in offices occasionally and get moved around quite a bit, but at a placement structure for the older kids, it happens to be called a soul family program, but I'm wondering what the situation is with, with foster care and why we can't seem to help these kids, and, and you know, especially the older ones who age out of the system. Any ideas? It's a, it's a tough problem, uh, and unfortunately for folks at the local level, it, it can become a, a moving target if the state uh, pivots to a different program. In Finney County, we had a juvenile detention center. In fact, it's named now for uh, Representative Russ Jennings, and we took half of that and we made it into a facility to accommodate foster care. Well, then the state decided that they weren't going to put foster children into a facility like that. Uh, and suddenly we had, we had empty space, we were holding the bag. So uh, a lot of local institutions, local families need predictability out of the state. All right, go ahead. Anna. Oh, I was just gonna add on to uh, what Representative Clifford said. You know, we need to analyze this problem from start to finish. Uh, we need to analyze what's happening in our society and in our communities that causes um, children to be separated from their parents. Um, and that's why, you know, the, the answer unfortunately isn't simple, otherwise we would have already done it. But we need to take a look at the overall system all the way from, you know, what's, what's happening in these situations, what can we encourage as a state, uh, state government to, to keep families together to prevent these situations from happening in the first place, all the way to, you know, providing adequate care for these foster children on the back end once that situation does happen. Uh, my wife and I were foster parents for a while, and uh, it's it's just heartbreaking the, some of the stories that that happens in in these families. And going through that process to become certified, uh, it's it's a it's a struggle. It's tough. Uh, Should to it be that tough? There's also been some some discussion about maybe I don't know if relaxing the guidelines, but you know maybe changing them up a little bit. Well, ultimately, it's a pendulum. If you if you relax the guidelines too far. Uh, it becomes an unsafe environment. If you make it more strict, you're gonna lose those foster homes. So finding in that pendulum, finding where that, that half-bee medium is, is, is a struggle sometimes, I think. I would say, uh, to the administration's credit, uh, Secretary Howard, who heads up Department of Children and Families, is a, has a great heart. Uh, she's hired a wonderful staff, and it is a vexing problem, but I think they are really on track to make some impacts on the foster care system. I mean, that's, that's one of our big budgets there. It's a billion dollars, DCF. I mean, I have KDHE's budget right here. That's, that's four billion. So our social service budget committee really uh, has all of the administrators in the social realm coming into us, and we get to ask those hard questions because we control their budget. Uh, but I've been very impressed with the, the people uh, and, the, and the progress and the really uh, active solutions that they're seeking. Oh, we'll keep our eye on that. We do have someone on the line with us now, caller Larry from Hoisington. You have a question or a comment of our guest this evening, Larry? Uh, yes, I do. I was curious about uh, home insurance costs. They've been going up year after year. And I was wondering where the end of this is and, and how people that are on a fixed income uh, are going to be able to withstand these large increases year by year. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'll be happy to jump right into that one because it's not just insurance, it's property taxes too. And unfortunately with the housing market coming out of COVID, the, the housing market just exploded. If you look at a chart over the last 25 or 30 years, there's been a few little blips and then 2021, 22, uh, it was just such a spike. It was a sharp increase. Unfortunately, when it comes to property taxes, uh, insurance, it's all going to be based on the value of your house. Insurance is a replacement cost. What would it cost to rebuild if, you're, if your home was destroyed? And so they, they take those, those values on what the costs of the materials are. Uh, you know, coming out of COVID, we had the supply chain shortages, which increased, reduced the supply, increased the demand, prices went up. Um, the property taxes are the same way. That's, that's probably the number one call I get is about the valuations of these homes. Uh, what can we do for people that are on, on fixed incomes, especially our older seniors? Uh, I don't really know what we can do if there's any programs on insurance, but we certainly can, can do some things and are trying to explore expanding the, the property tax relief, especially for those folks, uh, low income folks on, on fixed incomes. And Commissioner Clifford, just to clarify, the property tax, that's primarily a, a county assessment, correct? That's correct, but the state controls uh, over 20 mills, uh, 21 and a half, and that $100,000 exemption that's in the new property uh, tax bill will impact that statewide 20 mil. Uh, the other thing, and, and uh, I'm a former commissioner, I'm a representative now, but Adam and I have been commissioners in the past in our counties, um, you know, we have always asked the state to fund the local ad valorem tax, the demand transfer payments. And uh, for 20 years, the state legislature and, and in concert with the governor of the time have decided not to follow state law, not to pay that. Uh, my own home county, Finney County, last year would have reduced uh, their mill level by about three mills just had that transfer payment been made and not left in state coffers. So. Uh, we, we continue to push that uh, somewhat unsuccessfully, but if we could, it could at least get the uh, ex uh, increased exemption on the statewide 20 mil, will have an impact on, on local property taxes. You know, the state uh, asks counties to do an awful lot. Uh, they, I could sit here and list about nine functions that are really delegated to the counties, and the counties have personnel cost increases, as this caller indicates, the insurance is more expensive, materials are more expensive. Uh, we really need uh, legislators who have a local view of things. Former city commissioners, uh, former college trustees, former uh, county commissioners who really think locally and realize the impact of some of the things we try to do in Topeka. I'll give an example that's in play right now. There's a bill to prevent the use of tax dollars for lobbying expenses. In other words, the Kansas Association of Counties who are paid partially from county dues would no longer represent the counties in Topeka. The League of Municipalities paid again by dues paid by cities would no longer be able to represent cities in Topeka. Uh, that's wrong. And uh, we, we need to work to kill that bill, but it, what, it is in what play now. What the options be? That seems kind of odd well, to me. The, the options are your local county commissioners or city council or school board members have to make the trip to Topeka. Now, if you live in, if you live in Manhattan or, or that other city that's uh, across the, <laughs> the other side of the Topeka, you know, maybe that's not a problem. You're less than an hour away. But, you know, when I was a county commissioner as a county, we belonged to the Association of Counties and, and several other groups that, that represent our interests in Topeka because that's their job. They can be there every day watching what's going on in committees. Uh, I traveled down to Topeka several times to uh, provide testimony in a hearing uh, when it was an important issue, but uh, I can't spend as a county commissioner or a city council person, you can't spend your entire day during the legislative session trying to pay attention to everything that's going through the Capitol that could potentially have a negative impact or a positive impact if it's something you want to go down and support. But that's, that's the alternative essentially mm -hmm. is I would have to do that but then under that bill, I wonder how that would work because if I'm, if I'm being paid as a county commissioner and I'm going down there as my capacity as a county commissioner, would I even be allowed to do that? Exactly, Adam, and <laughs> probably, it probably violates our constitution. But uh, this is part of the battle over school funding that some members of the legislature don't like that they're paid lobbyists representing education in those hearings and testifying. 
and so they put up legislation like this. But uh, I, I just can't support things. That, that, that's our free speech. That's our right to representation uh, to those who govern. Um, so, but uh, keep an eye on us. We will do that. Thought we would also talk about um, something, and, and you mentioned this too at the beginning, talking about some of your committee work, Adam, that uh, our, many of our uh, area representatives have, and other lawmakers have signed on to an amendment that would guarantee the right to, of guns in the Kansas Constitution, change it to that wanted to find out how we feel about that and what are the odds of that happening? I'm not sure what the, the odds are of uh, bringing that up. And we had the hearing in the uh, Federal and State Affairs Committee, and it's basically expanding, uh, clarifying a little bit in, in the Kansas Constitution that the right to bear arms also includes uh, ammunition, uh, fire equipment for the firearms, uh, there's been some cases over the years that that's kind of a little bit of a gray area and there's been some limitations suggested uh, by by gun control proponents to okay you can have the gun but you can't have the ammunition so we're, we're trying to expand the the definition of what is uh, constitutionally your right to bear arms and what are your feelings well I certainly have supported that I signed on right away a, a number of states have tried to restrict access to ammunition uh, either through limiting uh, the amounts or publicizing uh, through uh, credit card receipts uh, who's buying what and uh, we, we think that's an infringement on our Second Amendment rights so uh, you know we're in an election year and uh, sometimes things don't happen because of uh, the impending uh, election um, and I, I don't know that that will get traction this session, but it, I've certainly signed, out, signed on and I'm, I'm very supportive. And, and you both have stated that. I'm, I'm curious that um, people who are not supportive of that have, have asked for something a little bit different, talking about safe storage of weapons. And you think especially when a family that has children and keeping weapons away from them, is that an option? Uh, well, yeah, actually in my experience that was one of the requirements uh, when we became foster parents is we had to have safes for all of our guns and we had to have a separate safe. You can't uh, contain your, your firearm and your ammunition in the same safe. You had to have separate ones. So we have that in, in our home uh, still even though we aren't foster parents anymore. Uh, just trying to provide that additional level of safety and security. Um, I'm not sure if there's a bill out there that, that's suggesting that. Um, we haven't heard anything come through the committee yet, but you know, I think it's reasonable to expect uh, if you're going to have a firearm that you'll, I, I would want to as a parent uh, for my own kids and for any children that might come over to visit, uh, making sure that things are safe. Uh, you know, my kids, we've, we've all went through gun training with them, what's safe. Uh, we don't leave it laying around the house by any means, but you know, if you did see a firearm, what would you do? What's the safe thing to do? Uh, we don't pick it up and play with it, obviously, but just trying to, to minimize that exposure, I think, is, is smart and wise, but I'm not sure that we necessarily need legislation mandating that because that should be uh, common sense for a gun, gun owner. <laughs> you, common sense, that makes me think of something I read, I think that was today or yesterday, and it, it just kind of astounds me. I, I think that, that it was a bill that might be uh, brought forward talking about, uh, we know that we have legislation now where you have to move over when you're driving on the highway. If there's an emergency vehicle, stop there. Now there's discussion about the same sort of requirement for a disabled vehicle. Um, I'm not sure where that stands, but to me it seems like that's common sense. Why, why, are, why do we have to legislate common sense? Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I drove an ambulance for the city of Austin before I went to medical school, and I can assure you uh, sirens blaring, lights firing, and folks just sit right there in, in the lane in front of an emergency vehicle. It's even worse now with the proliferation of cell phones. You know, folks are oh. very distracted right. driving. Uh, bills actually been introduced to uh, restrict the use of cell phones for, uh, for youth, for uh, people in the age of 18 in uh, construction zones, uh, school zones, and, and other areas. Again, common sense, but yet people don't follow that common sense. So we do have a bill in play along that line right now. 
Well, part of the problem with that is it's, it's going to be no more effective than a speed limit sign. Mm -hmm. But what the legislation does, we're not trying to uh, control your behavior, but if, if there's a misbehavior or something that you've broken the law, there needs to be repercussions. If I'm driving 100 miles an hour down interstate and I run into somebody, there needs to be a severe repercussion. If there's no speed limit, speed limit they can't say, well, you were driving too fast. Uh, same, same way with this. If, uh, and my, my wife had the unfortunate circumstance uh, about a month ago, uh, was driving on I-70 around Abilene uh, at night, hit a deer. Uh, same situation. It was night. Uh, she got over to the side of the road. She wasn't sure how, how damaged the vehicle was, uh, but she didn't feel safe getting out because you've got trucks com coming by at 75, 80 miles an hour on the road. Um, it's, it's a bad situation, and I think part of it is people are distracted. They're not looking. They don't realize that there's a vehicle over there. Now, obviously, she didn't have red and blue flashing lights. It's a little easier to see emergency vehicles, but you know, she's over there on the side of the road with just her taillights on and a passenger vehicle. People aren't looking far enough ahead and paying attention to say, oh, there is somebody up there, maybe I should get over. But in the situation where they didn't and they struck or injured or even killed somebody, uh, there needs to be some repercussions, I, I feel like, uh, some legislation so we can uh, try to provide some, some recourse for drivers that are doing that. I saw that and it makes me think of something I read today or yesterday that uh, from the Kansas Highway Patrol, they were just anecdotally talking about they have given out so many tickets of people exceeding 100, 100 miles an hour. Yes. It's like, <laughs> I don't know yes. how people do that, but anyway. They think they're on the Audubon. But, yes, exactly. <laughs> they think they're, that, that there is no speed limit. Well, we have a, a, just a few minutes left, and I wanted to give you um, Mr. Clifford, an opportunity to talk about capers and where we stand on that. It's always of interest to people out here, especially. We have a lot of people that are part of that program. And if folks don't know, uh, capers is the Kansas uh, State Employees Pension System. It's been around for quite a few years. Uh, it's worth about $26 billion right now, so uh, it's quite solvent. There were years, especially when the teacher's uh, pension, which was broke, broken at the time, was absorbed into capers. Uh, that the funding, uh, actuarial funding of it was dismal in the 50% range or less. Uh, now we have it to about, depending on whose numbers you use, in the low 70s uh, with a goal to get to 80%. So uh, we have uh, in our financial institutions, we oversee CAPERS. Uh, Mr. Alan Conroy is the executive director, uh, very, uh, very well versed in uh, legislation. He used to head the revisor's office. Uh, but he has an excellent board of, in, of investment for professionals, and they do a very good job. We're in CAPERS 3 now, and that's a little bit of a problem because it hasn't really be, uh, it's not really fulfilling uh, what people really need to retire on, particularly teachers and other state employees. So uh, I think you'll see us uh, in this session and the next tweak it a little bit. Uh, I already carried a bill to allow the CAPERS board to invest in more alternative investments, we were capped at about 15%. Some states have 45% of their uh, trust fund in alternative investments. What, what which, does that mean, alternative? That would be something other than stocks, bonds, real estate, which are more conventional investments. So uh, it would be like uh, funding a, a power plant somewhere, oh. uh, a, a toll road, uh, a warehouse. Things are not that quite liquid. They're illiquid assets. Now, we just don't buy a toll road as capers. We go in with three other pension funds, and there's a lot of due diligence. But these projects tend to uh, have a much higher return. Uh, and CAPERS counts on 50% uh, of that 26 million is based on the return on investment. The employers give 35%, the employees 15% uh, to that trust fund. So uh, it's, a, it's a big item for our state workers, so they deserve a, a good pension for the service they uh, give to our citizens. And uh, we'll make sure it works right. And it's going to continue to be uh, funding, well-funded? That, that has changed. Yes. Uh, when we had the original surplus of federal funds, we put 1.125, billion into CAPERS, and we continue to add to that. The governor's budget, I think, has about four or $500 million proposed. I don't think we'll put that much in. The markets, of course, have been quite favorable, so our, our funded ratio uh, is much better right now just through investment growth. 
Hopefully it stays that way for a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have been visiting with Representative William Clifford from Garden City, District 122, and Representative Adam Smith from West Kent, District 120, with uh, some updates and, and information about what's going on in Topeka. And we thank you for visiting with us this evening and for our phone call from Larry. And of course, uh, we hope that you'll join us again next week on the Kansas Legislature right here on Smoky Hills PBS. It is an important service. It's your opportunity to find out what's going on in Topeka and to let our legislators and your representatives know exactly what you want them to be doing. They're here for you. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Becky Kaiser.